Good morning and welcome to the eighth meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2019. Can I ask everyone in the room to please ensure that mobile phones are off or on silent and not to use mobile devices for photography or recording proceedings. We have received apologies today from David Stewart, MSP, and Sandra White, MSP. Uh, Bob Doris is attending as a substitute member, uh, and also welcome Christine Graham uh, to the committee. The first item on the agenda is subordinate legislation and consideration of four negative instruments. The first negative instrument is the National Health Service Optical Charges and Payments Scotland Amendment Regulations 2019. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee have considered this instrument uh, at, its at its meeting on the 26th of February and determined that it did not need to draw the attention of the Parliament to this instrument on any grounds within its remit. Do any members of the committee have any comments on this instrument? If not, is the committee agreed to make no recommendations? That is agreed. Thank you very much. The next three instruments relate to the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. The instruments are as follows. The Food and Feed Safety and Hygiene EU Exit Scotland Amendment Regulations, the Food Composition Labelling and Standards EU Exit Scotland Amendment Regulations, and the Nutrition EU Exit Scotland Amendment Regulations, all 2019. Uh, under the protocol agreed between the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament, uh, we have already considered these uh, matters uh, last, at our last meeting in order to uh, come to a view on the categorisation and the procedure for dealing with these instruments, and we agreed uh, last week that each of those instruments had been laid under the appropriate procedure and given the appropriate categorisation. Uh, they are therefore uh, of low uh, uh, category and negative procedure. Um, can I in, uh, ask comments on each of these in turn? First of all, the Food and Feed Safety and Hygiene EU Exit Scotland Amendment Regulations. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered this instrument on the 5th of March and determined that it did not need to draw the attention of the Parliament to this instrument on any grounds within its remit. Are there any comments on this instrument? If there are none, is the committee agreed to make no recommendations? It's agreed. Thank you very much. The next instrument is the Food Composition Labelling and Standards, EU Exit Scotland Amendment Regulations. Again, the Delegated Persian Law Reform Committee considered this on the 26th of February and determined it did not need to draw the attention uh, of the Parliament to this instrument. Uh, are there any comments on this instrument? If not, is I the have a comment. Yes, yes, please, Emma Harper. Thank you, convener. Um, my understanding is that these amendments are minor and technical, and uh, and but it made me think about the future or future considerations with labelling, and uh, the standards required, especially when one of the paragraphs we read was about uh, the origin of meat from certain countries. So my concern is that uh, as we move forward with future trade deals and trade negotiations. I would want to make sure that our food products and standards wouldn't be compromised uh, with any future trade deals or labelling requirements. Absolutely, and, and that reflects the point you made when we first considered it last week. I, I think it's fair to say the nature of these amendments doesn't directly bear on those issues, uh, but it would be entirely appropriate at this point to write to the Minister while approving the instruments, if that's the view of the committee. Uh, and ask for some general uh, update on the position regarding the protection of uh, uh, such of Scot uh, Scottish beef and other designations. Is that in line with what your does, would that meet your yes. need? I mean, my concern was uh, if we're going to change labelling or how would it change? Do we make sure that we do protect our own produce in the future with any future trade negotiations? Thank you very much. Uh, clerks have a note of that. Uh, and we will ask for assurances from the government on that basis. Are there any other comments from members on this instrument? If not, is the committee agreed to make no recommendations? That's fine, we'll do it along with that accompanying letter. And the final uh, instrument for consideration is the Nutrition EU Exit Scotland Amendment Regulations. Again, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered this at its meeting on the 5th of March and determined that it did not need to draw the attention of the Parliament to this instrument. Are there any comments from members? If not, is the committee agreed to make no recommendations? That's agreed. Thank you very much. And that disposes of all of those items. The second item on the agenda is an evidence session with NHS Borders, whom I welcome 
uh, to the committee today. Uh, this is part of our series of evidence sessions with territorial boards. Can I welcome to the committee John Rain, Chairman Jane Davidson, Chief Executive uh, Carol Gilley, Director of Finance, uh, Nikki Berry, Director of Nursing, Rob McCulloch-Graham, the Chief Officer for Health and Social Care, and Dr Tim Patterson, Joint Director of Public Health. Welcome. Uh, I understand that, uh, Mr Rain, that you will be coming to the end of your eight-year appointment at the end of this month, and also that uh, Jane Davidson is retiring in April, so I hope you will agree this is an ideal opportunity to give, you, give us the benefit of your uh, experience before you move on. Uh, but clearly, uh, an important area of consideration for this committee is uh, financial sustainability. And again, uh, with the benefit of your team and also of your experience, uh, can I ask, first of all, uh, for your uh, summary of the position regarding financial pressures and uh, uh, your view on the prospect of achieving financial sustainability going forward? Okay, thank you very much, convener. Um, as representatives of a uh, comparatively small uh, rural board, now in special measures, um, I do hope our experience uh, can be helpful to the committee and perhaps uh, offer to you a different perspective. Um, we are in special measures um, because we don't have a balanced financial plan. Um, we need additional funding and we applied for brokerage in the middle of last year. Um, that meant we were escalated to level three on the, uh, the government's uh, escalation framework ladder. Um, and uh, in, in a way, it was a bit of a shock to us because Borders has always been seen as a good performing uh, health board. We've always delivered on the budget up until uh, this current financial year. Uh, and then we were taken even more by surprise to find that we're escalated to level four in November. Um, we didn't really understand why that should be until we received the letter uh, which informed us that the seriousness of the financial situation we faced was such that it justified uh, escalation to level four and also that coupled with the fact of planned leadership changes uh, which we can only assume is the fact that Jane Davison had meanwhile announced her intention to retire and uh, it was well known that I was coming to the end of my eight-year appointment term at the end of this month. Um, so that happened all quite quickly and we've gone from being seen as a board, indeed a board that has delivered uh, well in terms of waiting times and services to patients, uh, but a board that uh, has keeled over really in terms of uh, uh, managing the budget. We, um, one of the advantages uh, of uh, uh, being escalated and being on the ladder is that uh, we do get help with turnaround. And yesterday uh, we had a turnaround team, which is funded by government, arrive to uh, assist us. Um, so that's consultancy report to uh, enable us to uh, get back onto a, a firmer financial basis. There's going to be no quick fix to this. It's, we, we are planning on a three to five year turnaround. Uh, the extent of the overspend, and we, we have had brokerage now of just over 10 million pounds, um, and that on a budget of just little more than 200 uh, million. So it's a significant proportion. Um, and to pull that back is not going to be easy. Brokerage, of course, uh, and that, that sum in this current year has been written off, which is very helpful. But it does mean that we have an overheating of the economy of uh, NHS borders, that we still have to, to rein back. And we need find, to find ways of uh, transforming services, because we're not going to deal with this by uh, just by getting firmer grip and control over relatively small parts of the expenditure. This is uh, you know, pretty big stuff. Um, and the financial settlement that we've been looking at that uh, we have for uh, this coming financial year from next month uh, is, gives us a, 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 an even bigger uh, gap to, to be bridged. So uh, the reasons uh, why, I think there are two main reasons why we need a brokerage. Um, one was the inability to deliver sufficient efficiency savings. 
uh, of the magnitude that was required and on a recurring basis. I mean, we've delivered, we've put a lot of effort into uh, the efficiency program, much of which has uh, resulted in efficiencies that are of a one-off nature. Indeed, Audit Scotland in their uh, report uh, as our external auditors last year talked about savings required of an unprecedented magnitude. Um, the other thing is the low level of uplift that we've had as a board. Um, uh, our base allocation under the NRAC formula uh, has provided for us increases in each of the last four years of 1.7%, 1.6%, 0.4% and 1.5%. So that's, that's led to some pretty tough challenges. Um, we, we're a rural board with the smallest mainland board in Scotland in terms of population, but we have, of course, a large geographical area to provide services across. And uh, we have the, the highest percentage population of elderly people, uh, and all these, of course, contribute to additional costs. Uh, I think, uh, and I, uh, I, I would not want to be here pleading poverty. I think there is more we can do to be more efficient. Um, we, we can deliver more, I'm sure, uh, but it will take time. Um, and the turnaround support we are, we're now getting will help us. Uh, it, uh, just a final point, I would say that the board has not been blind to uh, uh, the difficulties coming down the track. My own view is that whilst we've, we've owned the problem of uh, not being able to manage within the budget, we've also owned the solution, and I think we've been trying to own that solution for too long, uh, rather than to uh, uh, have a, perhaps elevate the conversation at government level. I'm not saying there hasn't been a dialogue between officials and uh, uh, the NHS Scotland uh, and the Health Department but I think uh, I would accept some responsibility for not elevating the concerns that have been building up now for two or three years. Thank you very much. You used the phrase keeled over, which is quite a strong uh, piece of language. And, and, and it, I think it's clear from that initial answer uh, that there was a degree of surprise on your part at the, the speed and scale and severity of, of the difficulty into which you, um, the board has come in the last two or three years. To try and unpick some of what you said, I, I, was was part of your suggestion that, as a smaller board, it's more difficult to find efficiency savings than than than, than a larger board. Is that part of one of the points you're making? No, I don't, I don't think I, I would want to say that. Um, the question is very often put to me: uh, Is are we getting a fair crack of the whip uh, under the NRAC formula? And the answer to that is we don't know. Um, we, we, we know that rurality is taken into account, uh, but whether it fully reflects the additional costs of the rural board with scattered small communities does face uh, is something we don't know. Um, we are funded at the level of NRAC parity. Uh, NRAC has this existed now for 10 years. Um, I do know because I've been a member of TAGRA, the Technical Advice uh, uh, Group on Resources Allocation. So I do know that there have been reviews of elements of NRAC, uh, primarily the additional costs facing island boards, and there's been a review of the mobility and life circumstances element to see whether that is properly and fully reflected in the formula. Um, but, uh, it, it, I mean, I'm leaving the service now, unfortunately, because I'd like to stay, but I, I'm leaving. Um, and I do think the time has perhaps come for a more fundamental look at the NRAC formula. And I, and I say that knowing that that will be a major task. And it's not going to deliver a, a quantum of larger resources, of course. It's about the allocation and the sharing of resources. If I'm wrong, the, you, you receive relatively low annual uplifts because you start from a position of being above NRAC. Exactly. That's, you, you have more yeah. um, as your base. Yeah. Funding them in you, you picked me up, convener, on the expression I use of keeled over, yes. which is perhaps rather an exaggerated position because in terms of services, uh, we haven't. And at the end of this month, we're on course and barring a, a devastating turn in the weather or other calamities, uh, we're going to be uh, announcing um, 
and I think would probably be the best uh, in Scotland in terms of delivering uh, services. We will have no patients waiting over inpatients or outpatients waiting over 12 weeks. We'll have no patients waiting for diagnostic tests uh, beyond six weeks um, other than MRI, uh, uh, people waiting for MRI scans. And I think that's going to be the best in Scotland. Uh, we await that. I mean, it's not in the bag as it were, but I'm hopeful that that will be achieved. And we've always been consistent achievers in terms of A&E targets. Yesterday it was 100%. Um, day before that it was 97% on the four-hour target. Uh, we've been consistently good on cancer waiting times. So in a way that is it's a bit of an irony that we've not been able to manage the, uh, the money effectively, uh, <coughs> but there are reasons for that. Thanks for that. I, I, I mean, I, and clearly those measures are very important measures from the patients I view, but, but as you say, financial sustainability is essential in order to be able to continue to meet those kind of targets. Given what you've described and given the scale of uh, shortfall, if you like, brokerage certainly that's, that's involved, um, and I think you said it won't be easy to achieve financial sustainability. Do you believe it will be possible to achieve financial sustainability? Uh, yes, I do. I'm, I'm reasonably confident that over that time span of three to five years, we will be able to pull this back. Um, but uh, much depends upon future uh, settlements, of course, funding settlements as we, as we move forward. I, I know some of the things that have been described as mechanisms to achieve uh, future financial sustainability are things that are already in process, for example, the shift from hospital care to community-based care. Uh, yes, there's a lot of attention, obviously, and I'll call on colleagues to, to describe those, attention given to shifting the balance of care. Shifting the resource that goes with shifting the balance is perhaps uh, a rather trickier matter. I think perhaps the reason I use keeled over is that being on level four does have a demoralising effect across the organisation. Um, it, it concerns the board greatly. Although, interestingly, uh, colleagues and I travelled on the Borders Railway uh, this morning and we sat with somebody who we did not know and who listened to our conversation as we were discussing coming here today uh, and who said, I'm a consultant at Borders General Hospital. He'd been there eight years. We, we None of us here knew him. Um, and he was saying, and he works also elsewhere in Lothian and other board areas, but he was singing the praises of uh, his working environment, the team spirit that exists, um, and the conditions that uh, he works in. And when I asked him what the medical view was of the board being at level four, uh, it wasn't exactly dismissive, but he was saying, well, we just get on with the, the day job and we accept this kind of thing happens in cycles across the the NHS and it just made me think that it would be really good experience and, and information for this committee, for your committee, to hear from people on the front line as to how they experience uh, the real life uh, world of delivering services. I to do that as well. Can, can I ask you, f f finally, before I pass on to colleagues, uh, the Scottish Government's recovery team that you mentioned. What is the actual nature of the engagement there? Uh, I, I think you suggest that there's completely a new engagement, that there was no prior engagement until very recently. Uh, what, what is the engagement now, and, and what effect do you think that will have? OK. Camila, can I bring in colleagues on this, and they can uh, perhaps Please identify the, the individuals even in the recovery team? But... Uh, Carol? Carol Gilly. Okay, hi. Um, so um, the letter we received from the Director General in November said there would be a, a tailored package to help Borders to um, turn around its financial position. Um, so we've had a, in place since early December support from the Scottish Government's Board Recovery Unit um, who have um, provided us with expertise, um, external scrutiny and, and support to try and turn around our finances. Um, we have um, learned from them 
um, sort of um, tried and tested methodologies, processes from other places, particularly down south, where there's been success in, in financial turnaround. So they've brought that to us and ha have helped us set up, um, well, they've reviewed our governance roundabout turnaround. They've looked, they've helped us set up a project management office, which um, all, all of the things we want to take forward are going through that process. Um, we've got new documentation that we're following. Um, so they've helped us um, make sure that finance is, is, is a key agenda item in, in the organisation. And as John referred to um, just is today, Tuesday, yesterday, um, we've had, um, the Scottish Government has supported us to get some external turnaround uh, individuals, individuals that have worked in other organisations just doing turnaround. That's their area of expertise. They started with us yesterday, again, to provide that focus for us going forward. So the package has been very much tailored to our needs. And um, although it's early days, we have changed a lot of the way we were working um, with the advice and support of the Scottish Government. And do I, did I understand that to mean that staff have been seconded to NHS borders from the Scottish Government? Uh, so the, I don't know if the word seconded, they work with us. They're in borders a couple of days a week from Scottish Government and also we've got some external support that are um, non-NHS staff that are working with us at this point. Thanks very much. Jane Davidson. That's just, to, just to add to what Carol said, uh, um, so we've had people from the uh, recovery unit at, at Scottish Government pre-Christmas and we're very much working as much as we can in partnership with them just to get a level of confidence around the plan going forward so that by the end of March, uh, the intent is to have a one-year plan uh, put before the board uh, and then by August, uh, the next three to five years. But um, just to be clear, it is actually um, a company uh, that's providing a uh, turnaround support uh, to us and that company started uh, on Monday. What is the name of that company? Uh, Bold Revolutions. And they're acting, they're supporting you on behalf or on the appointment of the Scottish Government? Yes, that, broadly that's right. Okay, thanks very much, that's useful to know. Uh, brief supplementary, Brian Whittle. Good morning, it's just a point of clarity here, you said it's a, a three to five year plan on turnaround, can I just uh, be sure here that, that, that mean, does that mean you'll require brokerage of, for each of those years before you hit uh, financial sustainability or will you across the piece uh, hit, hit? Our brokerage uh, in this coming financial year. Beyond that, Carol? So we haven't bottomed out our three to five year plan but I can say with confidence next year, that's in 1920, we will require brokerage and likely for a number of years after that. I couldn't pinpoint how long exactly but yes, we will require brokerage for a number of years. Okay, thank you. The, the Scottish Government has indicated that brokerage will be provided and will be uh, uh, effectively forgiven um, over the next year or two but certainly not for five years. So they've agreed to give us brokerage for the current financial year and, um, and that was helpful um, to uh, enable us to deliver financial targets. They've indicated that the brokerage we received for this financial year, that we don't need to repay that. Um, we flagged up to them we'll need brokerage for future years. We haven't finalised exactly amounts with them and they haven't confirmed that, that they're comfortable with that, but we flagged up that will be an issue. Thanks very much. Anna. I think Jane had a... Sorry, Jane did. First. Uh, th thanks, Kavira. I, um, just, just to confirm, part of the, the submission uh, by the end of March of the first year's financial plan will allow that conversation to happen with the Scottish Government. And then by August, when it, we look to three to five years, uh, and what this uh, uh, turnaround team through Bold Revolutions is going to help us identify, uh, that's when we'll be able to, 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 to uh, more or less nail what uh, potential brokerage might be required going forward. Is it not the other way around? Uh, arguably that you, you have the discussion with government first to find out what's possible and then talk about the turnaround? So I, I suppose we're, we're, we're doing it in, in parallel. We've been having those discussions with FLAG that certainly next year and probably the following year we'll be uh, looking to access brokerage. So they're, they're aware of that in their financial planning. But it's actually just about coming to something that's a bit more concrete in terms of uh, amounts. Thanks very much. I think Christine Graham wanted to have a quick supplementary yeah, question. Yeah, just a couple of quick ones. I mean, and to pick John Rain up on something you said that, you know, it, it seemed that everyone was going along swimmingly and then you were surprised to find that the, you were in financial difficulty. Why was it a surprise? Was that, I mean, like it came out of the blue. And the second point I want to ask is to Carol Gilley when she said the turnaround team came, came and said made changes in the way you work. What were these changes? 
the, the, the surprise was more uh, being escalated up the ladder. Um, and I did say we were not blind to what was coming at us down the track. We, we, we have recognised that over the last two or three years it's been extremely difficult to make savings on a sustainable basis. Um, so the fact that we were in uh, some difficulty financially was not, uh, that was not a surprise. Audit Scotland, uh, our external auditors of last year flagged this up as being a, a real issue. Um, but I think we were surprised that really the change in the fortunes of NHS borders as a, a board that uh, has not been on the government's radar as a difficult board. We've managed uh, ourselves and done well. Um, so it was that surprising change, really, from being seen to be a good board to, in fact, seen to be a failing board. And we're not a failing board. And, uh, and I think that's a message we need to get across strongly to our staff. And I did this in a, an address to our uh, workforce conference on Friday. We are not failing. Staff are working hard. We are actually delivering. And the figures I gave you on access uh, by the end of this month um, are good. Uh, and Carol Carol Billy, I was going to come in, change, so just the explain. Changes. Yeah, so I think um, what they've helped us do is uh, refocus on the financial agenda. So, so in the health service, there's always lots of new uh, initiatives going on. And um, what we're trying to do is prioritise the ones that will have a, a financial impact. Not to say we won't do other things, but it's about actually focusing on the ones that will give us a financial benefit in the short term, and maybe in the longer term, look at other initiatives. So, really refocusing the organisation. An example. An example. Give me an example of um, where we focused, we focused our... I don't know what that means. Um, so I, I guess maybe in Nikki's world, there are lots of initiatives that we can do to uh, improve um, some of the care we give, but it might not have a financial benefit. What we're trying to find is opportunities to improve the care and also um, have a financial benefit. So maybe refocus on things like looking at our prescribing costs and looking at... Um, um, seeing that we've got the most cost-effective prescribing, which is good for the patient but also saves money, rather than doing something that just focused on, on, on the patient benefit as well. That's the kind of things we're trying to focus the organisation on, taking into account both the care agenda and the financial agenda. Does that help? Tim Patterson. Um, i just pick up what Carl was saying. I think one of the key priorities will be prescribing. I mean, prescribing costs have gone up significantly in recent years. I mean, we currently spend about £20 million in primary care pres prescribing. Uh, £25 million, sorry, in primary care prescribing, £10 million in secondary care prescribing. But the secondary care prescribing has gone up uh, by 42% in the past four years. Now, there are many causes for that. Actually, out with our control uh, one of the big causes, particularly for secondary care prescribing, has been the uh, changes in policy for the Scottish Medicines Consortium. Uh, Scottish Government policy now is it not just to consider evidence base whenever we're introducing new drugs, but to consider patient and uh, uh, the public's view as well as clinical view. So that has really broadened out access for these new drugs and the funding uh, because of the increase, as I say, 42% in secondary care prescribing in the, in the past four years, there hasn't been a, a commensurate increase in prescribing funding coming to actually fund that broadening of, of, of access. So we're, uh, we're looking at prescribing as one of our key priorities in order to get the, uh, what we call financial grip. And we're working very closely with our primary care and secondary colleagues. So we're supporting the primary care and secondary colleagues with additional pharmacy staff. Uh, uh, and we've also agreed uh, locally enhanced services with GPs. And locally enhanced services is actually focusing on areas where we are outliers in prescribing. So borders is outliers, for example, in uh, gabapentoids uh, as well as antibiotics. So the primary care will be looking at those areas in, in particular. We're also looking at areas where there might be medicines of limited value. Uh, uh, and we're working closely with the GPs. In the secondary care, we're particularly looking at biosimilars, which are extremely expensive, uh, uh, increasingly effective, uh, but again, not funded through the, the uh, prescribing budget allocations, even though the access to these drugs is now more. But our, our, our consultants are now really looking and, and drilling down on those areas, particularly moving from proprietary drugs to generic drugs. Uh, so this is really a joint... Uh, uh, and collaborative work with our primary care and secondary care to focus on this re this this really important area, which is which is responsible for quite a significant part of the overspend. 
So, so does that suggest that in the past there hasn't been that level of monitoring and management of demand? There hasn't been the access. So what's happened is that there's been an increase in access. As I've said, the, 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 the Scottish Medicines Consortium now, they used to actually focus purely on evidence based, particularly on quality adjusted life years. So any drug that would deliver on £30,000 per, per quality adjusted life year, it, it had to really achieve that that, that, that that criteria. Now access has been significantly increased. Now we're in a democratic society. I can understand there's a, a discussion with politicians and the public about what they want in terms of new drugs. So the access has been significantly increased to not just deal on quality adjusted life year costs, but also on what patient groups think and also what clinicians think. So that has really significantly kicked the, the kick-started the increase in spending in secondary care. So we've ha we're having to deal with that. Uh, the other factor which is driving our prescribing is the increase in the elderly. I think John has actually said we have seen significant increases, particularly over 65s. If you look at primary care list sizes, even though they've only gone up by about 2%, the actual number of over 65s in the borders on, their, on the GP's lists have gone up by 26%. And the over 75s to the 85s has gone up by 12% and 12% in the over 85s. Now that's a significant amount of older people People. Most older people have not just one, one uh, disease or one morbidity, they've actually got multiple morbidities. They may have four of them uh, to deal with. That has actually put a lot of work and stress on our GPs. And one of the concerns which has been shown in the borders and in elsewhere, it's that that's actually causing a huge amount of stress. A third of all GPs are saying the stress and the capacity and workload and also the prescribing uh, uh, costs have... Uh, has been driven by in, in primary care, particularly by older people with multiple comorbidities. Now, that's been a really good, uh, we've increased our life expectancies and we're trying to actually increase our healthy life expectancies, the, yeah, but, that, but that has been another factor. That point is understood. Thank, thanks very much. Um, uh, Emma Harper. Thank you, convener. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm interested in exploring further issues about uh, potential ways of uh, cost savings or difficult decisions that might have to be made in order to pursue um, supporting better practices or processes. And it was interesting to hear that you had shared the train journey with somebody that's worked for eight years and nobody knew him. And it's a consultant working at a level uh, where I would imagine there should be some leadership engagement. So I'm wondering, you probably reflect on that, but what processes do you have to directly engage with the workforce, whether it's nursing or allied health professionals or the, the frontline um, doctors? I mean, you're telling us or you're encouraging us to speak to the frontline people when you don't even know the frontline person yourself who's been uh, working for eight years. So because many of the frontline people we know have good suggestions for supporting and saving and, and providing measures that will will help. So what plans do you have or what do you do to engage with the frontline staff? I, I, I'd like to start off by replying, uh, but then ask colleagues to uh, add to what I'm going to say. Uh, the, the, the fact we didn't know this particular individual, he works part-time at uh, the hospital uh, and in a function where perhaps you wouldn't ordinarily uh, see him. But we do take very seriously the, the appointment of consultants. We actually have uh, probably the best, uh, the lowest vacancy rate of consultants um, in, in Scotland. It's only a few percent. There happen to be those few percent in very shortage uh, areas and shortage specialities. Uh, but we do as a board. Uh, I chair the appointment panels for consultants. Um, and Jane Davison, the uh, uh, Chief Executive and Medical Director, will always be there. And that's really a s symbolic to say that uh, we take our consultant appointments very seriously. Um, in terms of uh, what we do to uh, uh, relate to staff, encourage staff, support staff well-being, um, I'll just touch on a couple of initiatives, uh, but ask colleagues to, to, to add to it. When I came uh, on the scene, I was very keen because I'd seen this done in other areas where I've worked in the NHS uh, in England, uh, that we, we really need to recognise staff achievement, uh, right from the point of saying thank you directly, but also uh, in a public setting. 
and we have now run for five years an annual uh, staff award celebrating excellence function. Uh, Christine Graham knows this because she's uh, attended as a guest and no doubt will vouch for the fact this is a big event, nearly 400 people. Uh, it's run very professionally and it gives us an opportunity to recognise staff and also partners and the wider community. Um, we do also, I, I write personally to everybody who's retiring from the organisation. You might say you can do that in a smaller board, but uh, it's still, I, I think it's important to acknowledge people who've given perhaps a lifetime of service to the NHS, so at least get a letter from the board to say, well done. Uh, and we put on a, an annual um, little low-cost tea party for people who've retired. And we can do that as a smaller board, and I think that's important. But Nikki Berry may want to uh, to add to uh, what we do, particularly around uh, supporting nurses. Yeah. Um, hi, um, I, I actually apologise to the uh, the chap this morning because, like you, um, when he said he worked in in NHS borders and he'd worked there for eight years, I I, I was shocked um, because I'm very visible. Um, have been in his department but it is one of the departments that I'm not in on a regular basis and he's not he's not out but I know his wife who is another member of our staff and I know his wife well. Um, I think like you yes we should be um, out and about and we should know our staff. What we do is we at, at the chief exec um, welcomes every um, induction, so opens every induction with a welcome, which I have since I've taken over um, since November. So that's about me welcoming every member of staff coming into NHS borders, wherever they work. Um, and I think that's really important. It's really important that we are out and about. Um, I meet every student nurse in NHS borders, um, wherever they work. Um, I meet them throughout their throughout their three years and keep up with them as well. Um, from our value in our staff, we have and um, we've a number of initiatives that we we have ongoing. So we have our Wellbeing Wednesday, um, which this um, member of staff spoke about this morning. <coughs> That's about um, every Wednesday. Um, there's new initiatives, so mindfulness <coughs> sessions, um, <coughs> actually writing out to staff, thanking them, um, leaving um, bottles of water somewhere, um, fruit. Um, so just small tokens um, but I think what it's about what the staff are actually saying is it's not actually about them getting something it's actually about being visible and somebody asking them how's your day been um, is what you know is there anything I can do to help thank you for what you do so there is things ongoing but again this morning that was an example that somebody works in NHS borders and I don't know them so I'm going to email them today and I'm going to make a point. They meet um, they, uh, on the back of their eye matter. They have a coffee morning. Um, they stop at 11 o'clock in their team. So I'm going to make a point of going along uh, twice a week um, and I will make a point and, and go to that department. I mean, I, I think it's fabulous that we celebrate our staff. You know, as a former member of NHS and Fries and Galloway, uh, I, th I think it's great that we celebrate that. I think my question was trying to focus on what are you doing with the staff on the front line to look at cost savings or financial um, potential savings or uh, difficult decisions that have to be made? Are you directly engaging with frontline staff that look at how can we how can we show a, a way to reduce costs that way? Jane Davidson. Thanks, uh, Emma. Yes, yeah, so so um, we're particularly going out uh, speaking with staff, uh, talking to them, different groups of staff to. Uh, just replay uh, and communicate as a, as a bit of a, a repeated communication around what the financial position is, trying to uh, under, help, help them understand the magnitude of it, because it is uh, pretty serious, um, and, and also to engage with them to see what their ideas might be. We're using our uh, partnership uh, colleagues in particular to, to do that, so they're um, en engaging with staff directly to um, see what kind of ideas people might have for efficiency savings or just they're identifying waste um, and just to, to get their ideas about what might be able to, uh, to change uh, going forward. Uh, I think that's been really important. Um, for, but, but I suppose the biggest um, potential changes are, are not going to be just the um, sort of um, a, a small uh, pieces of um, control or, or, or small improvements, which they, they're very important because everything, everything adds up. So all those ideas that might be coming through 
uh, need to be heard and, and, and responded to. But I suppose most of the changes really are going to be in our clinical models, etc., uh, and how, how care is actually delivered going forward. And that's going to need to be really quite bold. Um, and, and we don't necessarily know what that's going to be, but uh, some of the ideas or, or insights that the staff have uh, would we'll, we'll be able to inform that, I think. Uh, and, and I'm just probably going to bring in um, Carol and potentially Rob, if he wants to speak about what's actually happening in the community around garnering, engaging with staff uh, and garnering ideas around the financial position. OK, so I was just going to go back to what I said earlier about some of the changes we've made. We set up a project management office. It has um, five... Um, streams of work, um, you know, actually delivering schemes and, and, and reporting on them and data. But one of the streams is ideas, where we're actually taking ideas from uh, the engagement that, that, that Jane referred to from our staff and clinicians. And we're actually reviewing these in a, in a kind of methodical way and feeding back to staff on whether there's, there's something we can take forward. So that's, first of all, we have got a process to try and, and get those ideas from the front line. Uh, on your question round about uh, difficult decisions, Again, I referred earlier to our new governance arrangement round about turnaround. So we, we set up a um, governance framework which um, goes... Every scheme that will come forward will go through our area partnership forum and something called the Clinical Advisory Committee, which is really looking at our clinicians uh, to come together to review any ideas we're taking forward so we can actually highlight any risks or any issues to, uh, to the board before we make any decisions on going forward. So in a very open and transparent way, we're trying to make sure we engage uh, uh, right across the organisation with, with ideas that are, are, are potentially going to go forward. Bob McCulloch. Thank you. Um, I wouldn't want the committee to get the impression that none of this work has been happening in the past. So uh, the board has been successful in uh, producing a balanced budget in the past, but it's been non-recurring savings that it's had to do. So there's been a build-up of a, of a gap, and that's what we're, uh, we're having to face now. Um, we haven't got the cavalry coming across the hill in terms of uh, bold um, revolutions coming into support us. It's actually joining with us in how we actually develop the work that we're actually currently doing. If I give you a very quick example, so I've been with the board for almost a year and a half now uh, in my position as chief officer. Uh, we do listen very closely to all of our workers and also our patients and our people who use our services. So one of the things that we introduced just over a year ago was a new service called Hospital to Home. Uh, and this was to try and alleviate some of the delays that we have, both in our community hospitals, but also our general hospital as well. And that was working with our care organisations, patients themselves, and also our district nurses to actually design a new uh, initiative so that we can actually enable that or, or support patient flow within there. And there's a direct uh, consequence on expenditure within that as well. So that was introduced just over a year ago. It's now running across the whole of the borders. It's in all five localities that we operate. They have capacity for up to about 70 patients, and we've seen a significant difference this winter that we've just had in comparison with last. Now, that's on the back of comments that we received from staff, and it's been well uh, welcomed by staff as well. Um, one, of the things, one of the things I noticed when I joined the borders was the engagement with both partnership and also the staff unions within the council. There's a joint staff forum which has been in existence for several years now uh, where both unions from the uh, council and also from the NHS borders meet. Uh, I think it's on a monthly basis and I attend those as often as I possibly can. And we take through those initiatives with them, we listen to them and we develop them jointly together. And that helps the introduction of it and the implementation of those. Very much. Can I just uh, uh, pick up on a specific example that I am aware of, because Christine Green was asking about specific examples, and I'm aware that pulmonary rehab is part of a process that works in other health boards to keep people out of hospital, and uh, so increasing um, uptake in flu vaccine, smoking cessation, and pulmonary rehab for people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So that's something that really, really works. Pulmonary rehab is cheap. So what progress has been made in NHS borders with uh, processes around pulmonary rehab? Jim Yes, I would entirely agree with you because it's obviously a chronic uh, a long life condition uh, and we want to support people with chronic obstructive airways disease 
uh, so that they can live in community where they actually want to do. So we actually this year have initiated a project and put some, uh, well, put significant funds into it to support Pomi Rehab programme and this will uh, mean recruiting additional staff, particularly physiotherapy staff and as you say, focusing on uh, supporting them in the community, uh, compliance with medication uh, and uh, to try and really so that they can live where they want to live and uh, avoid hospital admission. So I agree that evidence is pretty strong and we have prioritised that as one of our projects going forward, which has flowed out from our clinical strategy as a key long-term illness. In addition to diabetes, they're the two areas that we're actually focusing at, but I, I fully support that. I, can I say as well that, that part of, if we're, if we're looking at, at, at efficiencies, one of the areas which um, Catherine Caldicott, our CMO, has been leading on is realistic medicine. And I think that we must remember it is the clinicians who actually commit most of the resources. So anything we can do for realistic medicine, you're probably aware of this initiative, and this is, this is about uh, reducing risk and harm to patient, reducing variations in care, uh, prioritising best practice and supporting self-management. So our, our GPs and our hospital clinicians are actually leading on this, and I think that's probably one of the, the big priority areas that we will be able to generate uh, significant savings. We have a good structure in place in the east of Scotland. We're working across the three health boards. The, the medical directors meet regularly. They've identified prescribing. They've identified frail elder, identified end-of-life care, where a lot of cost is. We have local projects, we have a local lead for realistic medicine, so we're working with anaesthetists and our palliative care services to decide uh, what should happen, how to engage with uh, not just clinicians but families about having anticipatory care plans for people towards end, end of life care. We have a big project called RESPECT, which is a national project, again, supporting anticipatory care planning. So we ask patients and their families, do you want a curative type treatment or do you want a comfort type treatment uh, and I think this is where some of the real cost savings because it's something which until Catherine Calder would really pushed for I think it really wasn't on the agenda so now we have uh, we have posters up in outpatients we have leaflets that we give we give to to patients. Our GPs are fully on board with this so I think that is a really fruitful area for for if we focus on variation, if we focus on what patients actually want, I think that will help uh, generate savings, but as well as that, provide really excellent care for patients and their families going forward. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, can I go back to a couple of the financial points? Um, I noticed that there was a proposal to transfer uh, a million pounds or more from capital to revenue. Um, I wonder whether that creates risk uh, in given, given that you have one major hospital which, ca which is of some age uh, and where there are clearly capital uh, programmes that need to be invested in, what, what are the implications of that for the healthcare environment at Borders General Hospital? When colleagues referred to the non recurring measures we've taken to deliver financial balance, that is one of the measures we have used for the last couple of years, you're quite correct. Um, so NHS Borders gets uh, its pro rata share of the uh, capital formula allocation that exists across NHS Scotland. That's about £2.4 million for us, so that's not very much money. Um, but it does help us keep in a state in a, 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 a decent standard. And our backlog maintenance level um, is £8.4 which is a big amount of money. But if you look at it pro rata um, compared with other boards, it's actually at the lower end. So we have managed to keep our state at, at quite a high level uh, of standard. I, I could also mention there that um, the highest category of backlog maintenance is categorised into four categories, and the highest one... I'm not sure it's called high or significant, but the highest one, we have none of our backlog maintenance is in that highest category. It's all in the three lower categories. So just to re-emphasise, we have managed to keep our state in a fairly good condition. Um, what NHS Borders has um, been quite successful is, is bidding for additional resources, um, and, and, and that's a tack we've taken. So we've managed to get a significant investment in recent years in our IMT infrastructure and also an investment programme across our uh, primary care premises. So we have actually bid for additional money and, and managed to, um, to, to be successful there. In this current financial year, we've managed to... Um, uh, get funding for uh, additional funding for IMT, but also um, to secure another MRI um, 
was it an NRI scanner? An NRI scanner as well. So yes, there is a risk, but we have actually been very successful in getting additional resources from the capital's perspective into borders, and that has um, offset that, mitigated that risk. Finally, on finance, there is an a uh, 7.5 million overspend, I believe, with the uh, health and social care partnership. Where will that money come from? Okay, so I, I'll maybe ask Rob to come in a minute, but our scheme of integration, that's the kind of, the way we, we, we do business with the uh, IGB and getting joint board, um, sets out what happens with that overspend. So um, basically the IGB is supposed to come up with a, an action plan to address that, that overspend. If that's unsuccessful, um, then they can come back to the either of the parent bodies, either the council or ourselves, and add, um, and ask for additional cash to to offset um, the pressure they have. And in the case of this financial year, um, that's the situation we're in, and we have agreed to give additional support um, to the IGB so it can deliver on its financial targets. That be fifty fifty from the council and the health board. So, so the scheme integration says that um, that our, our rules are that um, depending on where the pressure is, it goes back to the relevant parent body. So the financial pressure in the main this year for the IGB is with the NHS. So it's the NHS that's coming up with the majority of the pressure. But Rob may want to comment a wee bit more. Uh, there, there has been additional money coming into the Health and Social Care Partnership from the Council. There was an additional three million that came in through the, through this year. At the moment, so they've rebased the budget. Um, we are facing particular challenges around the population that Tim touched on as well. If we project that to 2036, we're expecting a 100% increase and are over 75s, and we're beginning to feel that increase now. So we are having greater demand year on year for our services. Uh, we, had, we carried um, a shortfall last year from unmet savings of 4.8. So the 7 million that you refer to now, 4.8 of that has been carried over from last year within there. Um, so we are facing significant challenges within that. How we're going to address that is fairly long term. Uh, we know that people who are cared for within our health facilities, that's more expensive than we have if we do that within our care facilities. And we do know that we've got an imbalance at the current time. So the work that we're undertaking at the present time is to see if we can shift the balance of care. So we've undertaken uh, several uh, pieces of work over the last year to try and identify what that number is, and we'll be redressing the number of care hours that we provide at home and also the number of care beds that we provide. One of the particular challenges we have is the number of nursing beds, uh, particularly for advanced dementia cases that we have, and we've invested a further half a million this year in opening up more beds within one of our excellent nursing homes, and that's reduced the pressure on one of our mental health wards within the uh, General Hospital. So we expect to be doing more of that over the next two to three years to try and shift that balance of care across there. Now that doesn't mean that we make savings on any beds that we close or, or are able to close within that because we do need to carry an investment into the council services as well. So there will be a proportion that will go to prov providing a balanced budget. However, we do need to make sure that we shift that across. So there is a capacity within our social care providers. Thank you very much. Good morning to the panel. Thank you all for coming to see us today. I'd like to ask about leadership. Um, John, in your opening remarks, you referenced the fact that yourself and Jane are both about to leave, and that's a planned departure. I absolutely accept that. That's uh, entirely your right. Um, obviously, though, we have a, a rather worrying trend of leadership churn throughout our health boards in Scotland. Um, and I just want to ask what reassurance you can give to your successors um, that goes against the sort of starting to feel like a, a feeling that some of our health boards, those jobs are, are almost ungovernable, which is a, a prevailing sort of view that's starting to be felt in, in perhaps unfairly. But can you, what reassurance can you give to your successors coming into this difficult task? Good question. Um, it, 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 Jane Davison was good enough to give a six months notice of uh, her intention to retire, uh, which meant that we're able to uh, recruit a chief executive and Rafe Roberts will be joining us shortly from Shetland. Um, and I must say we, we had a very good shortlist. We had a, a lot of interest. Um, we had uh, probably I mean, in excess of 20 to 30 applications. So I think there's still an appetite out there uh, amongst uh, professionals in England and in Scotland to, uh, uh, to bid for uh, jobs as a chief executive. 
that there is no replacement, uh, permanent replacement for myself as chair. Um, the vice chair will be acting up from the end of this month. Uh, the recruitment of chairs, of course, is not a matter for the board. It's a matter for government and the public uh, appointments unit. Uh, they conducted a recruitment uh, exercise at the back end of the last calendar year uh, for a number of chair vacancies. Uh, I was informed on the 21st of December that they had not been successful in attracting anybody to replace me in borders. And, uh, and I do understand now that the, uh, the arrangements for re-advertising are likely to start any day now, and it will be for borders and uh, perhaps three other areas. I, 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 in a way, it's disappointing. Um, I, I, I do think the position of a chair in an NHS board in Scotland is extremely good. It's very challenging, it's tough, and there, there have been some lows, and we're currently going through a low, but there have been a lot of highs as well. And I would commend it to anybody um, who felt that they had the competences to uh, have a go at it, because um, I found, I, I've been a, a non-executive in England and Scotland now for 21 years, um, three chairmanships, and uh, I must say, I think the system in Scotland is extremely good, and I've enjoyed my time. Um, it can be high risk, and I think people will see that there is a reputational risk uh, for senior people in the NHS, uh, both executives and non-executives, um, when things go wrong. Uh, that may be uh, a deterrent, but uh, from my own point of view, I would encourage anybody to, uh, to have a shot at it, and I think whoever succeeds me will be in for a pretty stimulating time. Uh, um, Jane before bring Jane in, I'd like to just ask a, a follow-on from that. So, Jane, but, uh, please do address the, the substantive point. But can I also ask you, uh, Jane, um, are you content... I mean, it sounds great that you gave so much notice because there's a lot of succession planning that can go into that. But it is also uncommon to lose both the chair and the chief executive at the same time. So are you content that you built into the systems and the people around you can offer a continuity of organisational memory and uh, in terms of that, that sort of shared vision of where you need to take the board? Uh, have you built that in? <clears throat> so I, I suppose actually you, you might be better asking the the colleagues around the table for that particular <laughs> um, one. Well, just just but but I will um, I address that. Uh, so the levels of interest in this the chief executive's post were high, um, and it was levels of interest from people who are already in the health and social care system. Um, so uh, I don't think um, that uh, th there's any less desire to um, uh, aim for the chief executive role or senior manager's role um, in NHS Scotland, certainly not through the Borders uh, job. Borders is a, a great place uh, to work and without everybody who contacted me to ask um, about the Borders, it is a tremendous place to, to work. The, the, the people that work in it are absolutely fin fantastic. Um, so I, I, I could only commend the, the, the role in the Borders. Um, I, I, that's not to say it isn't uh, incredibly challenging, but it's also very rewarding. Uh, and I think this uh, period that we're going through is is probably in the next year or two um, with uh, the, you know, the Audit Scotland, for example, we're talking about you know, bold changes because the demand in health services is, is outstripping the resources that are going to be available just in this public sector uh, environment. And um, I mean, that, that's just, just, just understood, but I think that will bring a level of excitement and probably innovation uh, to, to the environment that, that will be um, really welcome. Um, as far as um, am, I, am I making sure that there's organisational memory, I, I would say yes to that. Um, the people who are in the executive team uh, do have organisational uh, memory. There's pretty long-serving um, executives. And the, the most recent ones, are um, we're, we're working very, very closely together and certainly have been even more so in the last six months to make sure that people are absolutely understanding where we're at so that it's not all within one person's sort of knowledge base. So I have, for the last um, six months, um, been making sure that my colleagues are involved, absolutely involved, even in some of the uh, decisions or, or management uh, pushes or actions that I would 
generally just sort of crack on with, um, but that I've been involving them and helping take you know take them along with my thinking around all of that. So um, the the very fortunate position is that um, Rafe Roberts actually used to work in the borders, um, and while it's a different organisation from the one that he left, um, he has uh, he has the knowledge of the people just 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 here around me actually as well. So I think that's going to be. Um, in incredibly helpful too. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Good morning. I'd like to follow on from that, Cole Hamilton, but come down from a different tack. Uh, uh, you mentioned, Mr. Rains, that special measures and the fact you can't balance the budget at the moment. But when you do look at the fact that the, the chief executive's retiring in April, the chair of the board yourself is uh, leaving as well. The director of nursing, Ms. Buffery, left in November 2018. My gut instinct, my gut tells me that this is an organisation and a management team that's struggling or there is a lack of leadership there. You know, is that the case? Do you believe that's the case or is there something you can explain here? I, 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 I certainly don't believe that is the case. Um, perhaps I ought to make it clear that I have no option. I've come to the end of my second appointment term. So I haven't completed eight years. Uh, there's no way that uh, I would continue or be able to continue. I think one of, the, uh, one of the challenges we have as a small board is that we are seen as a bit of a, a, a ground for staff to develop and move on to bigger boards. In my time, we've had uh, four, four directors, uh, medical directors. Uh, Nikki is the fourth uh, nurse uh, director, director of nursing, midwifery and acute services two chief executives in my time. So that's all in eight years, uh, which you could say is a healthy thing. Uh, people move on to bigger and better job or retire. Um, so I don't see that as a worry. There are still people um, who have that corporate uh, memory, who have been with the organization for a long time, senior people, Carol Gilly for one, uh, and I think Nikki's been uh, a board as uh, em employee for, for many, many years. So, and further down the chain, of course, in terms of uh, management staff, people uh, are, uh, do have that uh, long experience. But I do think there's, there's an issue about the fact we are small and uh, people look to uh, progress and become directors of nursing uh, or medical directors in larger boards. The health board compared almost to like a provincial football club that you start mm. there and look for a bigger team without, you know? without the rewards, <laughs> I'm afraid, or without the bonuses. Yeah. Uh, but uh, could uh, uh, basically you've said earlier on, Mr. Rain, that you owned the problem, you said you owned the problem and you owned the solution, but you seem to continue down the same tack. So you also said you'd like to stay if it was possible. If you stayed, what would you do differently now? Um, I think, and I perhaps hinted at this, that I think we, we did own, we, we own the problem, we own the, 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 the whole issue. We tried to own the solution for too long. And I think um, it, 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 if I turn the clock back a bit, I think it was up to me to elevate the, the seriousness of the financial situation uh, rather earlier than we, than we did. And I think, and I'm struck by uh, your governance uh, report where you do talk about the need for uh, health boards, executives, non-executives to speak up. And, uh, uh, and I do think there is a reluctance sometimes. There's an, there's a, an inbuilt sort of uh, protective instinct, really, that is, this is a problem. We can solve it within ourselves. Um, we don't want to, uh, to be discussing bad news uh, but there comes a time when you have to. Mr Rain, if you owned the solution, your own professionalism would kick in at that point and say, right, I need to sort this. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I agree. Um, we owned the solution for uh, a period of time uh, and then it got uh, to a point of being unmanageable. We have put a lot of governance into our efficiency programme and we've had a... Um, I established this some years ago... Um, almost uh, a select committee type arrangement where we've had a finance uh, uh, group of non-executive directors who call managers and executives to account on the delivery of the efficiency program and that's been meeting regularly and staff come in to explain how they're getting on 
uh, and where there are problems and what can the board do to uh, unlock those problems. We've now converted that subgroup into a fully fledged uh, committee of the board as a finance and resources committee um, to uh, perhaps re-energise, put more effort into uh, uh, finance governance uh, and also take some of the weight off the board because agendas do tend to be and they have of course in the last 12 months been uh, dominated by finance issues although we do uh, try to keep the primacy of, uh, uh, of quality and safety uh, very high up in the uh, the agenda uh, of the boards. Okay. Thank you very much. Bob Doris. Thank you very much. Um, now obviously, there, there's financial challenges uh, with the board. That, 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 that comes out clearly. So, so one of the things we'd want to look at would be uh, in relation to where you're accruing costs and, for example, the use of agency staff is, is a clear way you're accruing costs. Um, now, reasons given for that range from sickness cover patient acuity, vacancies, there's a variety of reasons given for that. Now, I'm not going to get into sickness absence cover because one of my colleagues wants to particularly uh, look at that, but what I, I would ask more generally to begin with, um, that's a cost for £3 million a year in, in agency cover. Do you think you're starting to get the spend under control? Can we expect that to reduce? If so, by how much and what are you doing to make that happen? One of our biggest areas of overspend is on uh, nursing costs and uh, use of agency. Um, and Nikki uh, perhaps will explain what has been happening to uh, reduce that uh, overspend. Um, uh, so, so, yeah, Bob, um, regarding the nursing, um, the agency spend, we have had issues with recruitment, um, like every board across Scotland. Um, we've been very, we've been extremely proactive, but it isn't just about recruiting from, um, you know, HEIs, from student nurses. It's about actually growing your own. So we've been going through. There's a, a we've had a number of initiatives which have been um, about looking at our skill mix and making sure that we, um, you know, if we can't get registered nurses, then actually, what what does the skill mix look like? How do we deliver care? What is that? How how do we deliver it differently? So we've, um, this year we've. Um, We've trained healthcare support workers. We uh, worked with one of the local colleges, and we have a, a band two healthcare support workers that are training to become band four healthcare support workers. We've been working with um, our HN, the HNC students, open universities, return to practice, so that we could actually manage the vacancies. So we have 23 registered nurse vacancies at this moment in time um, across the NHS borders, and the majority are within the acute within the. Borders General Hospital. We had an extremely successful recruitment um, just in the middle of February where we interviewed um, over 30 student nurses and we have appointed to 30 um, we have appointed to 30 posts. Now they, they won't register, they won't get the registration until September. Um, but what we've done um, over this last year, we did this last year, was we brought the student nurses in as band fours. We paid them band fours because they finished their management students one day and then they work on the nurse bank as a healthcare support worker um, the next day. But we recognised their skill set and we developed a framework of competencies and they're supported by the practice education facilitators. So they will go into their, the wards that they've got their registered nurse post and they'll be in that in there as a band for until the registration comes through. Um, regarding the agency spend, we've, we have been running the um, workload nursing and midwifery workload tools, um, looking at what actually, what is the establishments on the wards. Um, so we've been running them using the professional judgment because you need to obviously make sure that, you know, what is the, what is the staff and levels on the wards. We have been um, working really closely with our senior charge nurse regarding rostrum um, and looking at actually the, the, man the basic management pr principles of rostrum um, and managing the rosters on the ward, so managing the annual leave. Um, the sickness absence, again, is, is one of the areas, and I know Brian's wanting to come in on that, um, but the sickness absence has been, so the, the standard is 4% and within NHS, NHS borders, um, the nursing sickness absence is at 
per se in nursing and midwifery. Um, so we, we've been, I have taken, so personally, I have taken every phone call. I take every phone call for agency in NHS borders and I have done that um, over this last year. Um, and actually we are beginning to see a reduction in our agency spend. So at the end of the financial year last year, it was 1.2 million. Um, was our, our nursing spend um, this year it will be at the end of the financial um, the end of financial year it is less than the 1.2 million it's just under the million um, so there's still a lot of work to do um, but we are we are focusing on that and that's about making sure that we have staffing post and we're not relying on agency and looking at our supplementary staffing as well so looking at our nurse bank I just check then um, so 23 vacancies um, which are currently been filled by either bank nurses or agency nurses um, on a kind of longer term basis unfortunately. 30 posts for band fours going to be embedded in, 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 in acute wards um, by around September. Just <coughs> nurses in yeah. September, yes. Right, okay. Now, are you suggesting then there will be no nursing vacancies by that point? No. So, so again, we've got return to practice. So we have return to practice. We have open university, staff that are doing open university. We're looking at the skill mix. So that was the, the band two to the band four. So actually, how do we skill mix differently? So there's, that, there's multiple things that we're doing. Because there's, there's 23 va vacancies, and if those are band five vacancies, for example, some of us are band five nurse in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, and you've got a, a newly qualified band four nurse coming in, when you're really the, an experienced band five nurse, then you still effectively have the same levels of vacancies in relation to the skills mix. So the, the very clear question I'm asking is not, uh, is welcome these 30 posts are coming in, but what I'm asking is what will the vacancy level remain say September this year, what will it be? Because you're saying there's 23 just now, you've mentioned 30, that would suggest to anyone outside looking in, that will just disappear. What will the vacancy level be in September this year? So I, I don't have that and I can get that to you. I don't know what the vacancy level will be. Will be. OK, I think... I th what, what we can say is that there will be a vacancy level because we have a, a turnover uh, that, that um, we would expect to see. Um, I think what we're trying to do is trying to minimise the, the vacancy level um, as, as we're going forward with these recruitment examples that Nick has <coughs> um, offered you. So I, I would say, without I don't think we've got that forecast, but I would say that um, 20 is, is, is something that we see quite regularly with turnover and retirements, etc. as well. But we just need to try to minimise that. 20 vacancies for a gap of a couple of months whilst recruitment's ongoing is fine, but an enduring 20 vacancies is a hole in service. So I'm un unclear how any of this benefits us, so you don't know what the projected vacancy level is later in the year. A turnover of, of 2.6 registered nurses um, per month. Um, so we did have a mass recruitment, but we still recruit we still have ongoing recruitment, so um, it's not that we're sitting waiting for this mass recruitment to come in in September. We still have ongoing recruitment. This was an opportunity to recruit from the universities and the newly qualified, but we're still doing um, recruitment out with that as well. So to push it a little bit longer, convenient. So right, as I get the fact that there's attrition in any service, whether it's retirements or, or nurses moving to maybe a a more senior band position, even another health board or whatever. So the attrition level is very, very helpful. Are you managing the attrition levels when you suggest 23 nurses is the vacancy level anyway? That's separate from the attrition level, is that correct? Yeah. So we can discount the attrition level in relation to the level of underlying level of vacancies. That's 23. And, we're, and Jane Davidson suggesting after these 30 posts come online later the year, that will drop to around 20. That's still a significant issue, isn't it? 
It, it, yeah, it, and I and I think you know we recognise we still have a, a you know we still have a significant issue, and that's about how do we so if the registered nurses if we aren't able to source the registered nurses how do we you know what does our skill mix look like, um, and how do we it isn't just about the skill mix it's about how do we actually retain our staff as well so how do we recruit the staff how do we retain the staff, um, how do we reduce the sickness absence which obviously has an impact on the ward. So there is there, there's multiple things, Bob, and I think we um, we we need to focus. There isn't just one solution, um, and that solution isn't just looking at your universities and your um, your students coming out of the universities. It's about actually what does the workforce need to look like for the borders. For, for myself, and, and, and I'm, I'm happy if you want to follow up and write with this, given time constraints or whatever, but I'm always being apologetic when I ask this question, but one of the biggest risks that we have in the public sector at the moment is in relation to uncertainties in relation to Brexit. There's no speech going to happen in relation to Brexit, but I know that a lot of public or local authorities in Cosla, for example, are scanning forward in relation to what those risks look like, whether that's going to be EU nationals leaving, or, or, or recruitment dependent on EU nationals. A lot of agency nurses, for example, will be EU nationals as well. Have you written to all your EU national nurses, for example, and says, uh, you are welcome, please stay, what can we do to retain you? Uh, what is the exposure that uh, the Health Board has in relation to the uncertainty in relation to Brexit, and what are you doing to, to deal with those challenges? I won't ask you any more about that, convener, but I think it would be remiss of me not to ask that question in, in uh, John this context. Uh, I think we'd like to reply to that as well. Um, t Tim is our resilience uh, champion here and is, uh, knows about the Brexit preparations. Yes, uh, um, I mean, with Brexit, we hope for the best and plan for the worst. Uh, and uh, there's been a lot of planning going on. Uh, each board has a Brexit planning group, and our group is chaired by our uh, director of Workforce. So we have actually undertaken a survey of uh, any of our workers who might be affected, any EU national who might be affected. We're making sure that they have full information and we're supporting them particularly in application for the uh, resettlement scheme. So I can reassure you that we are uh, very active in, uh, it's a small number in the borders, I think it's 57 we've uh, identified. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of other Brexit planning going on. Uh, there's, uh, we have uh, on our multi-agency group, our, our multi-disciplinary group, we have pharmacy input. So we're talking about uh, medicines. Uh, I, I, I think the, the Scottish government and the UK government haven't asked boards to do anything specific around medicines. I think the manufacturers will be stockpiling for a six-week period rather than ourselves. We've been looking at other contingency plans, particularly around food, supplies. Again, we have business continuity plans for those anyhow. Uh, and we're obviously working with our partners in the council who are very active in this and very concerned about Brexit, particularly the impact on small businesses and particularly farming community. Uh, so our, uh, our, our preparations are, I think, well advanced. We're working with our partners. Uh, we now have to uh, report to our Health Resilience uh, Scottish Government group on a, on a very regular basis going forward. Any any issues flagged up so that they can consider what the implications might be for things that we report to them for NHS across Scotland. So uh, a, a brief note on the staff survey would be helpful. Emma Harper. Just a quick sup. Thank you, convener, to Bob Doris's questions and thank you, Nicky, for answering him about sickness and absence and, and everything. I'm interested if, if there's 2.6 nurses per month turnaround, is it acute care, primary care? Is it across the board? Is it in a particular area? Is there any trends as to where these 2.6 turnarounds are? Most of the vacancies are within the the uh, acute division, but that's where most where the biggest nursing workforce is. Um, we've had a, a large number of retirements, um, so and that's one of the things that we are factoring in. There isn't any trend, um, and a lot. I think. 
what we're up against is that actually it's a it's not an employer's market, it's an employee's market. So we have, I have, an, I, I have some nurses that are moving within, within NHS borders because there is, there is vacancies, the choice is there. Um, the choice is there across Scotland. You know, when I qualified, and I'm sure when you qualified, Emma, there, there wasn't the, the choice that there, there is now. So this is about actually how do we make ourselves really attractive? And that's why I'm meeting every student nurse that comes into NHS borders is because I'm saying, how do I make, you know, how can we be as attractive? How do I make sure you get the best experience you can? You know, what is it we need to do differently? What type of job would you like? You know, is it a rotational post? So there's not any, I'm not seeing any trend. I'm seeing retirement um, as being one of the big reasons, but nothing else. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, David Torrance. Thank you. Just to go back to Brexit, um, you were talking about stockpiling medicines there. Has there any, been any work done around the cost of medicines coming from the EU and how it will impact on your budgets in future years? Um, I think I mentioned that this is really a Scottish Government, UK Government um, management. Or the advice to us is really just to be aware of what's happening. They will provide us with advice. So we haven't, I haven't had information. Uh, that, that would be done at, at the UK and, and Scottish Government level. Uh, thank you, Kevin. I was um, listening very carefully to the, the, the responses you gave to uh, Emma Harper around uh, your interaction with, with staff, also to, to uh, Bob Doris's line of question here. And we know you've got, you have a long-standing high sickness uh, absent rate, which to me suggests um, a system that's under pressure. Um, I think that's that's something that's come out along a questioning of, of, of many many of the boards. I think um, if I marry that up with with your uh, sort of off, off the cuff suggestion that you, you met your the consultant in a on the train in the way up, who suggests the the working environment uh, is a very positive working environment currently for your staff, notwithstanding the fact, and I'm sorry to say this, there's six members of a board here didn't recognise one of the consultants who'd worked with them for eight years. My, I think my question is around, or my concern is around your interaction with staff here, because there is a system under pressure here, I would suggest, in terms of, of, of recruitment retention and this high sickness level. Yeah, just for clarity, uh, be, uh, there are only three of us uh, on the train this morning, <laughs> not, not all, all of us. Thank you, Jim. Um, so sickness absence, uh, so if you look at the um the statistics which were very which were last year, but our sickness absence rate in NHS borders was um was actually um just below the Scottish average. Um within nursing though, we do nursing and midwifery, we do have a, a higher sickness absence rate. So um in NHS borders our sickness absence rate is six point four nine for nursing and midwifery. Um, we are looking at that. So Again, across every other board, the sickness absence rate for nursing and midwifery is higher than the national average, which is five point something percent. Um, we are looking at that. We're looking at um, why are people making sure that we are actually being a, a decent employee and making sure that pe employer and making sure that people have the return to work so when they come back to work. Are we following the sickness absence policy? Do we have flexible working? Um, and you know, forty five percent of the nursing and midwifery uh, workforce is aged between 45 to 55 in NHS borders. So actually, um, you know, how are we supporting those staff? Occupational health and safety and our wellbeing Wednesdays is one of the things. Um, one of the um, one of the things we mentioned today um, today on the train coming up was actually a. a a hydration station and the the uh, memory staff that we met on the train was saying what what do you mean by that and i was saying this is about having a, a ward clark case and um, being the first point of contact in a ward and having a jug of water and when you come into the ward them saying can i give you a drink this is about your well-being but this was about the teams so 
I, we do recognise the, sick, you know, the sickness absence. We do recognise that it's higher than we would have liked, but we are actively working on that. And that's one of the things that I think, looking at where we are for our financial turnaround, if we actually look after our staff and take care of our staff, then obviously we won't have the cost pressure. We will have a reduced cost pr pressure on supplementary staffing and under the agency staffing. So... I'm, not, I'm hoping that I've answered your, your question, Brian. I think it's challenging. I don't think we're alone. Um, and it's not something we're going to fix overnight. It's something that we need to keep um, need to keep at. And it is about the well-being. And I think it's something across the whole of NHS Scotland, um, the resilience of our staff and well-being. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. And you're right, it's not, you're, you're not alone here. You know, having worked with... Yes, in Ireland, a very similar uh, issue to this, and, and um, if I may, uh, maybe a little a chat, a chat with them might uh, uh, um, be helpful because they've managed to turn the, their uh, uh, theirs around. But I'm very interested in this. I've heard this over and over and over again. We have an aging, you know, uh, what's, sorry to say, <laughs> aging 44 to 55 year old. We knew that. We've kind of always known that, so I've never quite understood. Nobody's quite answered me the question: Why have we not planned for that? So, um, I think we well, I think we did plan. I'm not sure we planned for nurses retiring at 55. If we actually really planned for that, so I think we we have planned for our. For the workforce, but actually being able to retire, this the the special class status and being able to retire at 55, did we appreciate that? Did we appreciate how many staff, how many nurses would retire? I, I don't think we did. Um, I think it is also about we. The focus may have been about um, students coming in. I think we need to think differently because actually we can't just depend on student nurses. We need to look at what do we need within the borders? What is it we actually need from our workforce, from a, 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 a health and social care? How does that need to look? So I think it's a, it's changing. Um, yes, it's changing for many reasons. It's changing financially. It's also changing because People want to be at home. People don't want to be in an acute setting and they want to be looked after in their own home. But we need to have a workforce that is that is designed to deliver that rather than a workforce that has for many years been designed to deliver acute nursing. So it is it's changing. Um, and I think um I think the retirements um we probably didn't um, appreciate how many nurses would retire. But I think we have planned, um, but things have changed over the years. I think, Karina, okay. this goes very much to a wider question of uh, training of workforces in the NHS um, and recruitment and uh, education. And, Jane, you may want to, uh, to comment on that. Um, so I think it's really a, a question of national workforce uh, planning and um, I think there's a workforce uh, plan uh, due for publication uh, quite soon to, to, to take us looking forward. Um, but I think if you look at some of the disciplines in you know, radiology as well as nursing, etc., I think there's there's just been that, as Nikki says, actually maybe a, a, a different... Um, a appreciation or a, 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 an appreciation gap of how people might want to um, live their lives, live their working lives and, and later lives as well. But having enough people coming in through the pipeline is definitely um, a challenge, I, I think, across across Scotland, across the UK and, and internationally as well. Uh, thank you. And good morning to the panel. Um, from the evidence which you submitted, um, you pointed out that NHS Borders is reliant on NHS Lothian for some specialist cancer treatment. Um, so I wanted to ask specifically, um, how is this treatment um, negotiated by NHS Borders with NHS Lothian for uh, patients across the borders? Yeah. Um, yes, uh, obviously. Uh, uh, sorry, can I? Yeah. Shall I take that? Um, <clears throat> the, we have regional planning, uh, and obviously Lothian is our provider for specialist cancer care. We work through a, a network called SCAN, uh, uh, and uh, uh, it's been a, a network managed clinical network which has been in operation for a number of years and has worked extremely effectively. I think uh, what what also has changed. I think I mentioned previously about about. Uh, 
the, the pressures on acute sector prescribing, uh, and I think you're maybe re referencing as well, uh, particularly some of the more expensive cancer drugs, uh, which uh, are putting pressure on a prescribing budget, particularly the secondary care. Uh, that's all managed through now what's called a PAX Tier 2 panel. Uh, and uh, the PAX Tier 2 panel uh, that Lothian use, uh, they make the recommendations and we usually, in fact we do actually, uh, listen to their advice. So our, our system is to actually be advised by SCAN and be advised by the Lothian PAX Tier 2 panel in terms of these really expensive uh, drugs. And a bit like uh, other uh, drugs which have come to the SMC, uh, 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 if drugs haven't been approved by SMC, they would go to this panel. Uh, and the decision isn't just around effectiveness and cost effectiveness. The decision is very much around what the public feel and also what the clinicians particularly who are managing the, the, the patients feel. So, so it, it, it's a much more open access and uh, again puts, puts pressure on the prescribing budget because uh, the SMC open access agenda as well as the, the, the PAX tier 2 which deals with drugs which haven't gone through the SMC, uh, th that's increased the, the pressure on prescribing which isn't currently funded. Uh, so you've had these policy changes without uh, commensurate funding coming to the boards that have to apply them. The question was more around uh, surgical procedures um, than drugs, and specifically in the evidence you gave, you, you stated that the board monitors the situation to ensure NHS board patients are not disadvantaged. Now, I'm a Lothian MSP, and I know the pressures the cancer centre is under just for Lothian patients, and there's currently only two slots, I believe, provided for out-of-board areas. So in terms of that monitoring, what takes place for patients? Because there was no further detail on, on that. And who's responsible? So, um, cancer uh, patients, patients with cancer, um, they're, they're, they're tracked on an individual basis. So, um, we've got a, a team, our waiting times team actually manage it patient by patient, and we've got really good relationships with Lothian, uh, the network that, that Tim speaks of. Our clinicians have great relationships, but the, the teams managing it have good relationships as well. So, that's how it's, uh, that's how it's uh, managed. Um, and I, I guess there's also that kind of um, anticipation and sort of forecasting. We're built, we'll, we're built into uh, Lothian's planning as well. You know, there's discussion at the moment around a new, hopefully, replacement cancer centre for the whole East region. Um, given the budget pressures we've heard of, are you already part of that discussion as well? Because it would be significant for all health boards uh, to fund that in the future as well. And is there any commitment being made around that? Um, so, so we are um, part of these discussions uh, going forward, but we're also um, part of making sure that what we provide in the, the borders is um, uh, sustainable uh, and, and actually expanding and is robust. Uh, so we're, we're doing both. Um, I, I can ask Carol to just give you a little bit more detail around finances, if, that, if that's helpful. Um, so, so again, going back to what I was saying about earlier about capital funding, we, we bid for capital funding. So if you're bidding for a significant amount of capital funding, there is a process you have to go through. And part of that process is you have to get a regional appro approval. So we're very much bought into that uh, agenda, looking at you know the future of the Borders General Hospital, looking at the future of, um, as you say, the Cancer Centre at the Western. We, we're working jointly with our regional partners on, on trying to prioritise which of these schemes go forward on behalf of the region. And I just wanted to go um, off piste, really, on this question, because I know in September, um, Borders Council had recommended or, or made a statement around the merging of NHS Borders and Borders Council. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts or views on where that was going, because, um, you know, we have a lot of health boards who are coming to see us who don't have the advantage of having the same geographical areas. And from what we've heard today about obviously radical reforms may be needed in the future, um, not just around financing, but the delivery of services for an, an ageing population. Uh, what work was under, uh, being undertaken by the Health Board around that suggestion? It's, it's at a very tentative stage, um, but we have had preliminary discussions uh, with Scottish Borders Council um, around the the further development of joint working with the Council and the Health Board, bearing in mind that we, 
In terms of uh, the health of the population, uh, things that have to be done to improve health, so it takes pressure off health services, uh, a lot of those functions and services reside within the Council. Tim Patterson is the Joint Director of Public Health with the Council and the Health Board. Um, there's a good uh, joint working relationship already. Um, we've had tentative discussions about whether we can build on that, taking the, uh, the IJB model, really, of uh, improving health and social care services, but doing it collectively. And, uh, uh, and I do think, and it's a personal view, that we, we really need to look at resources um, collectively uh, rather than just health, just local authority. I mean, local authority, as you all know, is responsible for such a wide range of services from housing to planning to education, uh, services and leisure which impact upon health. So I think the, 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 the proposition that we work more closely together has a lot of validity. We've had those preliminary discussions. The Council was very keen to uh, submit uh, to the uh, Local Governance Commission uh, report. Um, that uh, became public knowledge because it was taken through the Council. Unfortunately, it, it caused some repercussions because we hadn't got to the point of even discussing it as a board. Um, it, it, it caused concern to staff, and we've had to assure staff that we're not talking about a merger. Uh, we're not talking about a takeover of one or the other. We're actually talking about better joined up working for the benefit of patients, frankly. Um, it might, because the council have a notion that ultimately we could see a single public authority in borders. Uh, that may or may not be achievable. I think if it ever is, it's way down the line and there are governance issues, of course, that need to be uh, dealt with. Uh, but we have looked at uh, matters like relocating to uh, council headquarters where they have a surplus accommodation, and we don't. Um, having uh, more shared arrangements in terms of central and support services with the council. So I think there's, it's, there's a big conversation to be had around uh, the development of local authority and health boards in terms of uh, improving the health of the population of the locality. And because we have that single local authority, single health board, I think there's a potential there for us to have a constructive conversation. But I think Tim would want to uh, add to that. Please, I have Rob McCulloch, Graham, and then right. Tim Patterson. Okay. Um, there's a long history of cooperation between the Council and the Borders and the NHS Borders, even before the IGB, before the Joint Bodies Act was put in place. We have many services which are, are jointly run, so our learning disabilities um, is, is an example of that, and also some of our mental health services are run jointly within those joint budgets. So there's a long history of that. And if you just look at the Borders itself, the two biggest employers within the Borders are the Council and the NHS. So logically, we need to be working very closely together, uh, and I'm sure that's going to get even closer in the future. The, the Act itself uh, gives a mechanism for, for expanding, that, expanding that further, uh, and those talks are, on, are ongoing and, and around specific cases where we do share services, and I expect in the future we'll be sharing many, many more services. Tim Patterson. Um, just to uh, agree with what Rob has said, I think we must recognise when it comes to health, of populations, 40% is related to socioeconomic factors. Uh, the council has a huge role in this. It's a huge role in employment, as you say. Uh, the, 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 the board and the uh, council actually employ 10,000 staff. Uh, so we work very collaboratively uh, and uh, in, in, in particularly dealing with these upstream issues, particularly early years, child health, alcohol and drugs. Uh, the chief exec of the uh, uh, local authority, Tracy Logan, is extremely interested in health. She supports the joint collaboration. Uh, we want to actually bring... There's different, they have different cultures. We must accept that there are different cultures, but she's very keen to actually bring the cultures together uh, and particularly to see what opportunities there might be. So we're, we're, we're really focusing on some of the public health opportunities, uh, particularly around the new national priorities. And, for example, Tracy is now leading for the East of Scotland 
Scotland on diabetes prevention. I mean, in my professional life, having a chief exec actually taking that forward, galvanising support within local authorities in the east of Scotland, actually getting involved in some of the more uh, medical and, and, and health issues such as weight management, I think it's been extremely welcome and, and very supportive. So there are opportunities. We're working very closely together. I think what John said, let's see what opportunities also present themselves in the future. Thank you very much. Emma Harper. Thank you, convener. Um, I'm interested in some of the work that's been uh, undertaken about health and social care integration. Um, there's uh, three principles that have been uh, listed in our papers. Improving the health of the population, improving the flow of patients through and out of hospital, and improving the capacity within the community for people who have been in receipt of health and social care to better manage their own conditions and support care for them. And there's also seven partnership principles, um, prevention and early intervention, accessible services, care close to home, delivery of services with an integrated care model, greater choice and control, optimise efficiency and effectiveness, and reducing health inequalities. So I'm interested in how the three key IGB objectives and then the seven partnership principles impact on how the Health Board considers performance and improvement. So that's specifically health board rather than IJB, I think, is the point. Um, okay, so the, the, we reviewed our strategic plan uh, last year uh, and we refocused it down to those three uh, very clear objectives so that it helps give that vision across all of the services, both in NHS but also in the council as well. Uh, and the idea of that is that we provide better quality services at each of those objectives, but also they will drive out efficiency so that we are sustainable to be able to carry those services forward. Uh, you asked specifically around monitoring, I think it was. So the monitoring within the IGB, we carry out, there's a monthly monitoring report, we have committees set up, we report to both the NHS board and also to the council as well within that. So the three uh, entities of the IGB itself, the NHS board and the council itself are, are kept abreast of what the performance is across all of those areas. Uh, there's a number of activities that have now been brought into uh, play, specifically around those objectives, and some of the funding that's been allocated through the IGB over the last 12 months are directly to support each of those objectives, and there's a whole list of them that we've funded uh, to do that. We mentioned um, some of the pulmonary uh, work that we were doing earlier. The IGB has funded that directly. Uh, I talked about the hospital to home service brought in earlier as well within there. And we've looked very much at patient flow through all of our acute settings. The last one is perhaps our most difficult one, to make sure that we've got sufficient care within the community to look after people after they've been through a process. And we're working very closely with our council colleagues and with the independent sector to make sure that that is the case. And we, one of the factors we look upon that is the, um, the um, return to hospital. And that's one of the factors we look at. And the early findings we've had from hospital to home, that's been significantly reduced. So we are looking to providing much more services after those uh, interventions with health so that we can maintain people within the community. One last thing, if I can add within that, the council is very well placed to access what we're calling the community asset, is to really look at what the communities themselves can actually offer this agenda. So the corporate plan from the council is around your part. So it's trying to work with our communities and our residents to find out, and the citizens to find out what is it that you can provide with this agenda, and we will help you to do that. So the review of the strategic plan for the health and social care has followed suit with that. So we are expecting to work with carers and with other organisations and direct with the public to do that. One last thing, sorry. Um, so we operate within five localities, and that gives us great access to the communities that are, are there within our five major towns that we have. And we've supported our local working groups to actually help us actually develop our policies and to develop our services. And they are active now, and we support them. And they have representation on the strategic planning group too. So there's a good link. We get that. We've heard a lot about set-aside budgets in this committee and what it's used for. And you've mentioned that the IGB is funding the pulmonary rehab and, and Dr Tim Patterson talked about uh, diabetes as well. Um, so 
and I probably should mention I'm the convener of the Lung Health Cross Party Group, so I'm very keen to hear about any processes about keeping folk out of hospital um, and supporting lung health. So I'm interested to know about, is it set aside budgets that's been used to support uh, pulmonary rehab processes, if that's IGB funding, or um, what specific uh, activity is being directed at improving patient flow and reducing admissions then uh, across the borders? So I'll pass this in a second. So uh, the funding that's come from the IGB is, is from a fund called the Integrated Care Fund. So that's flexible funding we've been able to use to pump prime initiatives within the community. There are other uh, services that are funded within the community that are in our mainstream budgets within there. It's not specifically within the set aside. Um, Tim, I don't know if you want to. Um, no, I, uh, okay. Thanks very much, uh, David Torrance. Thank you, convener. Um, around de delayed discharges, how difficult is it for you to eradicate them? Because of a lack of uh, around delayed discharges, how difficult is it for you to eradicate them? Because of a lack of care home places. Uh, if I can, uh, okay. Um, We've done a huge amount of work um, around delayed discharges. Uh, we, it was a particular challenge, not this winter, but the winter past. Uh, and we had a, a very, very challenging uh, time within our acute uh, facilities within that. And we learned the lessons uh, from that. We did a review, and on the back of that review, we introduced a winter plan for this year, particularly focused on patient flow and delayed discharges, a very close part of that. So we introduced a number of initiatives, uh, and we expanded quite a few others around step-down care, uh, <coughs> around intermediate care, and around getting people to their homes as quickly as we possibly can. We set a direction for the NHS and also for the council around discharge to assess, because we believe very firmly that the best assessment that we undertake with patients is actually in their home. And so that's what we're trying to do, to get the services out there. We've worked also with our providers of care homes and also within our providers for care at home uh, to ensure that their systems are efficient and that we're getting as much of the, that provision as we are paying for is, is we're trying to increase the capacity that they can actually offer within there. One of the difficulties we have in the borders is the rurality. So there are great distances involved in that. So it's, it's more expensive for us to provide these services than it is, say, within the city here or elsewhere. So we are looking at increasing the capacity both in care home and care hours. And we've got more this year than we've had last year. There's been a direct investment coming from the council it's out with IGB money uh, to fund some of those care places. And that's been a significant help with our uh, elderly patients with mental health issues. Uh, and that's been much better this year than it has been last. So it's an ongoing uh, target for us. We want to get down to zero. Uh, we've seen a significant improvement this year, and we've seen improvements in length of stay with an acute of around 15%, and we've seen a reduction of overall delayed discharges down about 7% if we measure the same time last year. Uh, and also we're ranking, we're sort of middle ranking now if you compare us to other boards or other IGBs within the country. Thank you, Convener. Um, you say there's, you're surprised at the increase in the number of under 65s who are needing 24-hour nursing care. How have their needs been met? Well, there's, there's many ways in which they're, they're being met. So it, within the home, we've put in uh, further services within the community. So within the central locality, in the Eildon locality, where there isn't a community hospital, we've moved out some of our uh, physiotherapists to work alongside our healthcare support workers. Uh, they're linked into our district nurses and our GPs are operating within their clusters as well. So there's a very strong partnership to make sure that we have the right people giving the right support at the right place at the right time. Um, now, the coordination of that is vital uh, to make sure that we are able to do that within the funds that are available, uh, and that's what we constantly monitor. The advent of the Primary Care Improvement Plan is another bonus for us uh, in seeing that through, and our GPs in particular are very engaged within that, and they're leading on six of the programmes under the Primary Care Improvement Plan too, which will answer some of the issues that you've just mentioned. Briefly, Miles, please. Thank you, Just thinking in terms of patients coming to Lothian for treatment, what's your cross-border arrangements like, and are you seeing uh, an increase or a decrease in terms of uh, patients going to... NHS boards for treatment or response uh, for within England. Yeah, so, so 
I wasn't quite clear if you were asking about Lothian or, or, or England. Could you see that? In, again? NHS That's England. So in terms of, I'm acutely oh. aware of patients coming to Lothian for treatment, but in terms of patients going to England, um, I know Newcastle increasingly um, is um, across Scotland where some patients are receiving treatment. I just wondered, given your geography, um, if you're, what the pattern is like currently and how that's um, being financed as well. Yeah, okay. So, so we used to have quite a lot of people coming from uh, England to borders, actually, um, and that's tailed off over a number of, of years as uh, the, the north of England sort of reorganised itself. Um, so some of that's tailed off. In terms of our flow across the, the, the border, I would say it would be mainly in um, elective um, patients, so for uh, knees or, or hips, etc. Uh, and and so that's very, very much a, a, on a whether we can source that a, a capacity. And also it's part of our, our, our standard operating procedure, has been for many years, uh, to be able to access, particularly Newcastle, actually, uh, to, to support us with that, and, and that's uh, it, it's, it's, it's it's part and parcel um, of uh, of our uh, planning for our waiting times uh, to to deal with that. So we factor in whether we've got the resources available to do that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we get additional funding from the Scottish government uh, to do waiting list uh, extra waiting list initiatives, and we've done some of that um, uh, this year as well. Have you used your golden jubilee capacity? for um, these operations as well? Uh, sometimes we use it Golden Jubilee, it just depend, depends what, what, what it is, but some of our patients, it's easier um, in many ways to, to, to go um, to, to Newcastle. Um, so we've got relationships with, with both, um, less so um, not as using as much capacity at the, at the Jubilee uh, now. We're trying to do as much of it in-house as we, as we possibly can. Christine Graham. Yes, uh, thank you very much for letting me in, convener. I mean, as you know, I've been a critical friend of NHS Borders for a couple of decades and high regard for staff. That said, I'm sure you'll be checking up, you know, all your consultants now. Uh, can I just have a couple of points clarified from you, please? Um, joint working with the Council, I understand. Can you just confirm, for the record, this does not mean Borders Council running NHS Borders or the BGH, because that's what the paper said and that's what scared people. That's the first thing. Second point is bold revolutions. What a name. What they act what's that company actually said you can do right away to make savings? Because we're coming back to this and I take no pleasure in your financial difficulties. But what bold revolutions said in your process is let's exclude prescriptions, the not prescriptions that you can do to make savings. Two questions then. John Ray. Uh, the first, the answer to the first question is absolutely not. No, no takeover by uh, the Council of Health, and uh, the, the the NHS brand is uh, sacrosanct. Uh, in terms of bold revolutions, they only started work yesterday, so I think we're we're waiting. Yep. So, to, but just to add to that, we have had uh, the um, uh, Scottish Government's board recovery team in since before uh, Christmas to to help us um, just make sure we've got enough rigour. Uh, around what we had, which was a project management approach, but but this is bringing expertise uh, to to us from from their 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 experiences. If I if I look at um, if I look into 1920 with our financial settlement, after we've paid our pay awards, and this has been the case for a number of years now, we're left with something like um, 600 thousand pounds to uh, apply and deal with other pressures. So if you just think about drugs, for example. So it's a, it's a massive challenge for us. So Bold uh, and the, the, the recovery team are setting our stall out that they will be able to help us identify 4%, 5% of 5% over the next three years, which in very broad terms would be looking at something like 10 million each year. And we don't know, Christine, where that's coming from because what I would say is, um, if, I, if you don't mind, if I go back to um, our annual review from... Um, 2016, 17. You know, it was, it was pretty clear in that letter that the demand and the the challenges around public sector settlements was across across the whole public sector was going to be quite demanding. But when we uh, hit last year um, with all the benchmarking we looked at, and we've got about eight million pounds of what we need next year in the in the bag confidently already, but we weren't prepared to class that as unidentified because we couldn't actually identify or, or, or see where the big 
bold changes we're going to come from and that's why we need assistance which is really very welcome and if we're able to achieve that four five and five percent that's that's what's going to really um, make the difference there but they only started uh, on on monday but these people and the experts from the recovery team as well feel are, are to saying to us and we take confidence from that that that's achievable a final area of questioning brian whittle just a, a, a simple one, really. I'm, we're obviously working under a new GP contract, and there's a sort of suggested disparity among acceptance between uh, in sort, of, sort, of, sort of urban and, and rurality. And given that you're uh, quite a rural uh, rural area, I just wondered where are the GPs and the borders? Are they supportive of the new contract and everything that it, that it currently entails? The short answer is yes, but I'm going to ask Rob to, to come in on that. But I just want to make one point, that, and we've, I've done this in boards and I've done it in the IJB and the board, except that it's, it's impossible to overstate the importance of GP practice in what we're trying to achieve. Um, sustainable, affordable services, it's very much uh, uh, shifting, shifting care, shifting resource. GP practice is pivotal to the success of that. We have 23 GP practices in the borders. Uh, we're working hard to sustain good relations uh, with our GPs. Uh, it's work in progress, uh, but Tim, I think, can give us, uh, Rob. Rob rather, can give us uh, a bit more detail around the primary care plan. Okay. Thank you. Um, I kind of referred to this earlier, really. Uh, the just as John says, the GPs are vital uh, in the work that we are doing with our communities, uh, both for providing quality primary care, uh, but also supporting our acute and, and admissions avoidance uh, within the hospitals too. Uh, we held a development session on Monday last, and the GPs were represented there. This was across the, all of the delegated services within the IGB, uh, and we were looking at what the future holds for us and the challenges that we're actually facing there. Um, it's true to say that the financial return from the new GP contract doesn't benefit uh, those GPs who are in rural situations as much as perhaps it does within the cities. Um, having said that, the GPs are welcoming of it uh, in the borders because we think it will allow them to get better or get free, their up their, free up their time so that they can get involved in the overall health agenda within their local communities, and that's to be welcomed. Um, these are uh, an expensive resource, a very worthwhile resource, and they work tremendously hard. Um, and we need to make sure that we are able to use that asset more than we're currently doing at the present time. So one of the comments that was passed at the um, meeting on Monday by one of the GPs was just precisely that. They're looking forward to a time where some of their work and their workload is passed on elsewhere, so it will free them up to do the real uh, health prevention work and health support work within the communities themselves. And I really look forward to that as well. One very quick example from one of the GPs that I've met saying that they deal with, in their consulta consultations, about 50% of their consultations was around mental health. And in the main, all they were doing was referring on to other agencies. Now, that's a really expensive piece of triage that we're undertaking there, and it's not utilising the GP for what they're there as the generalist expert, and that's what we need to move on to. So the GPs, the 23 uh, practices within the borders, are really keen. Uh, they fully worked with the development of the primary care improvement plan, and as I say, they lead in all of the six work streams within that plan itself. So we're looking forward over the next couple of years uh, with the implementation of that, of moving some of the other tasks to other health professionals and elsewhere so that we can actually make best use of the GPs. Which I will in a moment. <coughs> How do you envisage then tackling that particular problem of mental health referrals in rural areas? Will that mean more mental health nurses in practices? What's the plan for addressing that, that issue? That, that would be one of them. Um, there is a working with our mental health colleagues and those services to make sure that they're more accessible within the communities so that we can actually provide services you know, where people are rather than people having to travel there. Some of that's within practices, some of that will be within uh, other services within the communities, and some will be the third sector too. Uh, Brian Whittle. Thank you. Given what you said, Mr. Main, about the importance of GP practice in delivering this, this sustainable model that you're, that you're looking at, can I ask you how then are you monitoring GP practices and does the, 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 the new GP contract alter the way in which, which you, you, you gather that kind of information? Tim. Um, yes, the, the new GP contract has changed how practices 
actually monitor the quality within their practice. Previously, we had the quality outcomes framework. Now uh, we have what's called a, a, a quality cluster model. So we have four clusters within the borders, uh, and each has a, a quality cluster lead with uh, a GP with uh, some time to actually lead on that. I think we probably need a bit more time for them, but that's uh, another discussion. And then each practice has uh, a quality practice lead. Uh, and they will be, or they have actually looked at the quality outcomes framework previously, what is important for them. So it, it, it's actually an improvement because we're looking at what is the local needs in that area, particularly around long-term conditions such as diabetes, COPD, uh, a heart failure, a blood pressure and what have you. So they've identified key areas that they want to work on. They then work with those practices and they can, uh, uh, the health board can be aware of, of that work and actually support it as well. Uh, I think one of the things that, that Rob has said is that one of the key areas is actually the, the new concept of expert generalist or generalist expert expert generalist and uh, the the idea is that they really focus on things that you need a GP to actually work on so one of the big developments is actually well let's look at some of the other areas of work that perhaps advanced nurse practitioner can actually do uh, so I think that they recognize that that is a, a key area of development and working with our uh, director of nursing round uh, having a common framework for for training uh, and there are also lots of innovation going on around quality enhancement as well particularly working with Scottish ambulance uh, to maybe take undertake some of of the calls in the community particularly in, in the rural areas so I think the the, 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 the primary care contract has actually pushed a lot of developments and as Rob says the, the primary care improvement plan particularly we're taking vaccination immunization off them uh, uh, off practices in the next couple of years we're dealing with pharmacy we're dealing with MSK physiotherapy uh, and this will allow them to actually focus particularly I think I mentioned earlier the increase in elderly uh, I mean we are expecting next 15 years an increase in thir uh, by a third of over 65s and an increase in 75% of over 75s. The very, very complex, very, very complex, very complex. So getting those clusters to work together, particularly, for example, they, they could run on the, uh, in the future, they could, they could run warfarin clinics on behalf of clusters, they could, they could run long-term management on behalf of clusters. So it, 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 it's not only what, what the benefits now, it, I think it's the benefits down the road, and particularly once we bring in the, the, the real opportunities around new technology, I think the contract it will, will give us a good foundation going forward. Thank very much, Brian Whittle. Just a very quick one, uh, uh, convener, if I could. I just wondered, in, in terms of the primary care fund, has that money been fully distributed now, and, and maybe give us an indication of how much much that was? Uh, we haven't we haven't used the full funding in the first year, but it's transferred into the the following year, so it'll be, we'll be able to use it fully in 1920. Um, so, it, it, all in all, I haven't got the figures to hand, and I'll have to pass them to you later. But it's just short of three million over the three years. Okay. Ah, Carol Gillis. So, so we got this year just uh, around nine hundred thousand this year, and as Rob said, we only drew, drew down seventy percent of that, and so we're carrying thirty percent forward. The figure increases to just over a million next year, and the following year up to two million. So it kind of ramps up when we get the investment. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much. That's been a very full session. Can I thank our witnesses uh, for their uh, comprehensive answers? There are uh, a number of items which have been raised during the evidence session on which we will want to come back to you, and I think a couple of things you've already uh, offered us uh, some more uh, data. So uh, thanks for your attendance this morning. You will hear from us uh, on that matter. And uh, we will now suspend briefly and resume in private session uh, in uh, two or three minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you.